thank you so much for joining us. I know we've got a group in Dallas. Um, I'm jealous that you're all together for an actual in-person event. That must be very exciting. And then some people joining us virtually. Um, before we jump into the content, uh, which is gonna be purely focused on e-commerce, wanna make sure you get a chance to meet both myself and Claudia. So Claudia, do you wanna introduce yourself to the group? Certainly, thank you so much, Christina. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session and thank you so much for GDMC Retail Tomorrow to have us here today. I have been working with WD40 Company for the last nine years in various roles, including brand marketing, innovation and sales. Currently, I'm focused on building our WD40 omni-channel sales in the truck and grocery channel and also our e-commerce channel within the US Pure Play side. Really looking forward to a great conversation today. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and I'm Christina Vale, so I work at Profitero, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Profitero in a second. Um, before I joined the company, I was a practitioner, so I was at PepsiCo for a number of years. I did a lot of traditional brick and mortar roles, and then I moved over to the e-commerce team there. So from about 2015 to 2018, I was working on various retailers, trying to grow both the pure play and omni-channel businesses on behalf of PepsiCo. Um, from there, I went into strategy consulting, and now my role here at Profitero, I work with a lot of brands on their e-commerce strategy. Um, so helping to bring a consultative approach to how they're managing all of the changes and exciting growth happening in the space. Uh, a little bit more about Profitero, and then we will we'll jump into the content. So Profitero is primarily an e-commerce analytics platform. What many of you are likely managing now, um, whether you're on the brand or retailer side, is uh, growth in a channel that used to be probably single digit percentage portion of your total sales. And measurement for the channel is not as robust as measurement currently is for the offline world. So you're likely in organizations where you are really um, well uh, adept at reading IRI or Nielsen data or whatever sources you're leveraging and the e-commerce equivalent can be a little bit more difficult to um, attain. So what we do is we are pulling real-time data. We scrape websites around the world every day in order to pull in the digital shelf analytics. So things like, is the product in stock and available to purchase? Is it when someone searches for the product, can they find it? And bring those insights to, to primarily brands. We also work with some retailers. So that's us, happy to answer any questions. But the point of today is not to talk about Profitero. The point of today is to talk about kind of this, you know, I'm hurt, sure you've heard the phrase new normal. And, and frankly, we're kind of moving past this middle ground of where we are in this like new normal and trying to figure things out. Now e-commerce is, it's here to stay, right? There was a significant growth and now it is a typical sales channel within your organizations. And it really becomes, what do we do with it? And now that we've had this large change, how should we manage it? So we're going to talk a little bit about what were those things that change, what do the projections look like now, what is it looking like by vertical, um, and how are organizations reacting. We're then going to go into how to win. We're going to talk through a framework. We call it the DIVA framework. I will um, uh, I'll get ahead of it. There's a picture of Beyonce in this deck, um, so that will lighten things up, but we're going to talk about a DIVA framework on how to think about the channel. And then we'll leave time for Q&A at the end, but we also really want to encourage questions in real time. Like I said, you know, Claudia told you she's actively a practitioner in an organization that's doing a lot of things right at WD40. And then I've worked within um, a brand team and then I work with brands all day long, uh, thinking about e-commerce all day long. So we are happy to answer questions, whether it's directly related to the content or tangential. So let's jump into what changed. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're sitting in the room or you lived the last 18 months and you felt like, wow, you know, my organization was not ready for this change. We were not ready for 80% uh, of consumers to try e-commerce or, you know, whatever, whatever the number is for your retailer or your brand, you're not alone. Uh, Profitero runs a survey every year where we kind of assess the capabilities and how different organizations are feeling about e-commerce. Um, before uh, the pandemic, only 11% of brands indicated that they have uh, an e-commerce strategy that's activated across their company. So very low percentage, many were calling um, for opportunities to improve. 17% uh, believe they're leading 
So I think, you know, we ask these questions of salespeople at salespeople at different organizations. I'm sure Claudia can attest to it. Salespeople don't like to say they're not the best, right? So people were, were actively admitting, you know, no, we, we, we're not leading. There's opportunity to improve. Um, and then the majority said there were novices, right? That this was a new, a new space. And so, again, if you're sitting there feeling like, gosh, we haven't wrapped our, our head around this, we're, we really don't have a clear strategy or plan, you're not alone. And then, you know, what, what actually, what happened and, and what are the projections saying? Like I kind of previewed at the beginning is not that there was this blip in e-commerce and now we're going to go back to it being 3% of sales. Uh, consumer behavior has fundamentally changed. I know there's retailers in the room. I'm sure you've watched different CapEx investments go through your finance committees. Moves are being made that are going to be difficult to undo, right? So both the combination of retailer change and consumer change um, should lead brands to realize um, it's not going anywhere and the, the growth will continue. Obviously on a percentage change basis, right? The red line on the screen, um, significant change in 2020 and on a relative basis, apples to apples, 2021 will show relatively less growth, but the black bars, right? It's still going up to the right. So it will, e-commerce will continue to be a significant and growing portion of total sales. And, you know, right-hand side of the slide, shoppers prefer it, right? The shoppers we saw, I'm sure I'm not the only one on the call whose grandparents were using Instacart and click and collect, right? The, across all demographics, we've seen movement towards um, kind of a, a willingness to leverage these tools. And then, you know, beyond willingness, actually enjoying it and going back uh, and, and kind of repeat, I'm sure again, retailers, you're seeing trips are up, uh, size of baskets are up uh, across many of these e-commerce platforms, all reasons to believe it's here to stay. And then, you know, let's talk about your specific categories, right? So when we look across general merchandise categories, comparing growth in offline, growth in, um, in online, obviously the last year, there's been a lot of growth in general, right? And there's some categories like household toys, um, for any parents in the room, I'm sure that's unsurprising that even the offline world just went gangbusters um, from the, the impact of COVID. But the large trend, right, the trend across categories is that online sales, we're using amazon.com as a proxy, uh, will continue to outpace and did outpace um, growth in offline, even in a year when retail sales were just on fire. And then from a consumer standpoint, right, we previewed some of this, but loyalty, and, and Claudia will pick this up a bit, right, when we talk about how brands think about e-commerce, loyalty declined. And I mean, some of this is obvious, right? Like if your brand was out of stock, they didn't care what kind of toilet paper was being sold. They just needed, uh, you know, the 13th uh, package of toilet paper for their house. And so they weren't as loyal um, to brands. And then especially kind of in times of crisis, we saw that that willingness to stick to a brand went down. And because, and again, we'll pick this up when we get into the Diva framework, the criticality of getting on a list in e-commerce, it's just fundamentally more important than in the store because of the way that the consumers are shopping websites. As a brand, it's important to think about and making sure that you're getting on the list and you're trying to drive that loyalty in a channel where loyalty can be more difficult to attain. 73% um, of consumers tried new brands. So this could have been a period of time where you attracted new shoppers to your brand and new shoppers to your category. That's really exciting. And the key question now becomes, how do you maintain them? How do you keep them coming back to your brand and to your category? And then, you know, another, another stat on, on uh, willingness to to shop in uh, virtual virtual ways. And then kind of last last overview slide, I think this is a really important one. Uh, and I know that the category kind of nut-based beverages, we, we likely don't have folks in the room from the, um, the, the nut-based beverages um, category, but the point holds. So Califia Farms, one of our clients in this category is a category that we track often. And what it's showing is everyone except for the red dot and the purple dot, they experienced growth in the past year. So their category on Amazon, right? Good proxy for total pure play e-commerce grew and, and grew a lot. The ones that are in red, they're at, they lost share, right? So one of the things that's happened in the past year is a lot of e-commerce teams are being celebrated in a lot of different brands saying, wow, you guys did great, you know, 30% growth, 50% growth. Many are losing share. In this slide, only three. I actually picked up share. Calipia Farms picked up share in a big way, right? They were kind of well positioned to be able to capture that growth. So as you're now lapping last year's numbers, and as e-commerce just became, oh, maybe it's 5%, 7%, 10%, 15% of sales, right? Depending on the vertical you're in, maybe it's much more significant for others. 
as things start to settle and it's the, you know, this new normal is officially, okay, this is now the playing field, ensuring that you're able to continue capturing share and not growing at the expense of share becomes important. So then that leads us to how to win. So this is where we'll spend the majority of our time. Um, certainly if there, there's any questions on kind of the foundational stuff, uh, send them in. I, I expect there, there will not be many. But this content, this is really uh, to provide a framework on how brands especially should think about winning in the space. Um, and here's the picture of Beyonce that I promised. So the framework will stick in your brain. So we're gonna go through this acronym of D-I-V-A, which stands for being discoverable, informative, valued, and agile. So this will be our true north. And to, to kick us off on discoverable, I'm gonna pass it over to Claudia. Awesome, thank you so much, Christina. Yeah, let's start with being discoverable. The digital shelf is a lot smaller than the physical shelf itself, making real estate all the more valuable and all the more contested. The idea of that endless aisle is really a myth as I have discovered over my years working in e-commerce. And when you consider the average consumer nowadays only uses a handful of products they can only see so many on their mobile devices. You know, when they are about searching for products, they are not seeing that full list that they might see on their computer in the mobile device. It's a much, much smaller array of products they can see. It is really critical for your product to show up on page one. And I believe, Christina, you might even be able to share a little bit more details on that, what the particular placement even on page one means to us the one point, one to 10% placement versus the 10 to you know, 20 product placement on page one has a really significant impact on your conversion rate and on your sales ultimately. Yeah, definitely. So I was, Claudia and I were talking about this the other day and I'm actually working on a project right now um, in the frozen foods category. So we're looking at a couple, a couple different retailers and trying to discern what drives strong performance in search. Because the key thing here is, right, the focus for brick and mortar is figuring out how do I sell my products into the set, right? So it's a twice a year, you're doing line reviews, right, whether you're on the retail side or the brand side and you're trying to sell your product in so that you can get the attention of shoppers. This is a daily activity on the e-commerce side and it's ever changing. So I think of page one as being in the set. If you're not on page one, very few shoppers are going to page two. And the data that we've been looking at is what is the um, average sales for a product that's in the top 10 spots, for a product that's in spots 11 through 20, and then bottom half of page one, and then page two. And so if you think of those as like the four groups, there is a 100% increase for each rung that you climb. So, and this, we're looking at again, a couple of different retailers, and this really shouldn't be surprising, right? We're all shoppers. Think about the products that you end up putting in your cart. Very rarely are you going to the back of page two. So from a brand standpoint, we're gonna to talk to you kind of about the different ways you do this, right? How do you move your product up? There's a lot of different levers you can pull, um, but there are huge gains to be realized. And then also think about the flip side. One of the opportunities, especially with pure play e-commerce is forecasting because as products are kind of moving or you're trying to ramp them up, it can be difficult to predict demand. If you know that there's kind of these key thresholds and you're tracking your products to know, hey, we're in spot 15 and we're clearly rising, sales are likely about to accelerate significantly when we crack the top 10, that can be really valuable. And one of the key, I, I witnessed it, I lived it, the most effective e-commerce teams are ones that work cross-functional because of this dynamic nature of the category. So kind of having some of those thresholds in the back of your mind can be really helpful. Yeah, and Christina, to add on to what you were saying, it's really not static like a shelf set is. This positioning on page one or page two is changing throughout the day. So it is really critical to do the analysis and understand when is the majority of your shoppers shopping for you and then really make sure you are investing during those times. You know, that could be different days in a week or different times during a day that you really want to focus on your search campaign and um, really support that with your investment to get the biggest return on your investment. Definitely. Awesome. What are some of the other things? Winning search really requires that hands-on approach as we were talking about because you really want to make sure that you are understanding the constantly changes to the algorithm 
And you are really here seeing an example of the fed food, food product results from Walmart and Amazon. For brands that are, for brands, it's really a constant battle to maintain self, shelf dominance. And you can see why investment in retail media is really increasing. For us, Profitera data is showing us that brands can increase product sales by up to 50% when they move from product page two to product page one of search and increase sales by an unbelievable 86% if they can land in the top 10 spots as Christina was indicating earlier. So what our team is really focusing on is you cannot do this for a massive portfolio necessarily. So really categorize your product portfolio in top performers that you really want to do a lot of detailed analysis that really may are the big rocks that really make big movement and then tear it down to some of your other products, depending on what your resources are internally to really focus on this. Yeah, and just Christina, to is there anything to add from you? Anna? Yeah, perfect, perfect. So just to underscore that, that's exactly how I managed it when I was kind of on the brand side and how we encourage brands to manage it that leverage the Profitera data because you can't, uh, you, it's, there are typically not enough resources, nor is it kind of a wise business approach to say, well, we need to optimize all 500 SKUs in our portfolio. That's for, you're going to start competing with yourself, one, and two, it's probably not a good use of resources. And so if you know you know, these are the most frequently searched keywords on Amazon. So we know the most the consumers are going to see our products most frequently if we prioritize these five keywords. And then which products are you best positioned to win for those keywords, right? So that's going to be a combination of, is it the right pack size? Does it have strong reviews? Do you have the right content in place? Is it profitable, right? Both for you and the retailer. Those are the ones that you want to really encourage the shoppers to buy more of as they buy more. That's part of you're going to like the e-commerce flywheel. I'm sure most people have heard this phrase, right? But as you sell more, and if your fundamentals are strong on the digital shelf, so images, bullets, rings, and reviews, strong in stock position, you're going to keep selling. So the last thing you want to do is take an unprofitable skew that's probably not well positioned for the category or for the channel, and accelerate it and pour sponsored search onto it and enhance content because then all of a sudden the retailer any retailer, right? Amazon is like, Amazon or Walmart are the ones on the screen. Any retailer is gonna say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, we would prefer to not sell a lot of an unprofitable SKU, right? That's, it's not gonna last long. So keeping some of those fundamentals in the back of your mind as you think about how do I, how do you drive your share at page one is really critical. Awesome. One other thing for you to consider is really that winning brands are also making sure their paid strategies are effectively balanced with earned strategies. And this means ranking high in organic results. While media investment is really a critical component to drive conversion and sales, earned media strategies are also a critical driver and less costly to implement. Here you can see some of the factors that brands can influence in their content to rank higher in search without paying for it. So four really stick out across most of the US retailers. Number one is the number of used keywords in your product titles. Number two is the number of images used on product pages. And I would actually add videos in this conversation here as well, as brands are seeing great success with that. Then number three is product average star rating is critical to really drive sales. Christina, do you want to um, share with the team what the sweet spot is here? From my experience working on various brands, we see it to be around a 4.7 to 4.8% 4 um, star rating that we would like to see to really get the highest sales lift. Are there any um, additional numbers you can share from your end? Yeah, de definitely. So let me just start by saying the um, red, green, yellow grid uh, Profit Era does a lot of research to hack algorithms, if you will. So basically we run regressions based on various factors for all of the SKUs that are showing up on page one to determine what is most highly correlated. So the key thing, right, it's different by retailer. In those reports, we give very specific guidance. So we'll say, hey, on, on uh, Home Depot, we saw that a 4.1 star rating appears to be 
kind of that benchmark that you should really aim for. Whereas on Amazon, maybe it's 4.6, right? So I don't want to misspeak, but that data is all there. So my contact information will be in the back of the, the deck and anyone can reach out. I'm happy to share that data. I think, um, you know, the only thing I want to underscore is this idea of paid and earned. I think from a sustainability standpoint, if there's any finance people in the room, I'm sure they'll be thrilled to hear me say it. You don't just want to do sponsored search, right? The, it, it's helpful, but it's most effective when it's balanced with getting the fundamentals right. And the fundamentals are all those things across the columns, right? Having the right number of images, ensuring strong consumer sentiment via ratings and reviews, like that Claudia called out videos, right? We see that very highly correlated across most websites uh, in driving search and getting, getting those basics right. Because once your fundamentals are in a good place and you kind of reach those benchmarks, and typically what we do is work with brands on like a crawl, walk, run approach, so it's difficult to just start firing in all cylinders for all SKUs right away, right? But taking a phased approach, say, hey, for your top 20 SKUs, let's focus on images first. Okay, then let's try and get a video. You know, maybe run a review campaign, right? And get the fundamentals right for those core SKUs. And then you should start investing in things like sponsored search so that you can measure ROI of those things separately and figure out what's really working for your category and the retailers that you work with um, most frequently. because. So the idea of test and learn is critical, right? The what works today is not guaranteed to work in three months, not even guaranteed to work tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so having a rigorous <clears throat> approach to testing, learning, measuring, and then pivoting accordingly is critical. I don't know, Claudia, if you have any, um, I know we didn't prep test and learn, but any key insights on, on testing and learning? Yeah, no, I, I really think you're hitting um, the nail on the head, as we would say, we really focus testing and learning on our key um, skews and then extend it out because if we are starting to extend something out too quickly it's taking up too much much bandwidth for our teams it's really about being very efficient with your time and knowing <clears throat> what is working so testing on a smaller scale understanding what the success levers are and then extending it out is the right way to go and then also one of the um, additional measurements here it's really the number of product reviews and depending on which retailer you're thinking about, um, I'm giving you an example about Amazon. Amazon has their own wine program, which really allows you to gain product reviews really fast from their um, end users already. So we use that a lot when we launch new items, <clears throat> or if we are seeing, you know, some of our longer existing items doesn't have um, really new reviews we are participating in these type of programs with our retailers to really generate more reviews for our products. And that's been usually very successful and um, very efficient for the team to do and engage in. And that's the perfect setup for the next section, which is informative, right? So the first one, discoverable, shoppers need to be able to find your product. Okay, once they find it, they need to be able to learn everything there is to learn about your product in order to drive conversion from the product detail page. So, right, the old days, you're kind of, and sometimes in the current days, it still happens, but you see a TV ad, um, okay, I'm interested. You go to the store, you pick up the package when you find it on the shelf, you're looking at the nutritionals, you're assessing the package, you're thinking about what your friends told you about the product, and that's kind of driving this reputation. Now, that whole journey is going to happen on the product detail page. So they're searching WD-40, um, which is in a great position where people think of the brand as the product type. It's like the Kleenex, if you will. Um, and so they're searching WD-40, and then they need to figure out everything there is to know right on that page. So they need to, from the images, be able to tell, what's this package going to look like? What are the benefits it's going to give me? What's the price point? Does that match with kind of my, how valuable I think the product is? What do my friends think? Well, I don't care what my friends think because I have reviews right here in front of me and I can look at all that user generated content and understand, oh, wow, this did solve a problem that I also have, right? And the ability to craft that um, is the most critical element of driving conversion. The first thing, discoverability, that's all about traffic. And that's great because you really need to fire on both traffic and conversion. Once they land there, if this does not look correct, if they're not getting the information they need, the likelihood that they add the product to the cart is just super low. Um, and I know, Claudia, do you want to speak a little bit more about kind of user generated content and, and as that becomes more important, how you're thinking about it, WD40? Yeah, definitely. And I also want to speak about one of your um, support that 
Profiteros is really helping us, guide us here, because as you are saying, product content is the hardest working asset for you in e-commerce. And what you want to make sure is that you have all the fundamentals that are bright so you can really drive that conversion, because the last thing you want to do is invest in media and traffic to a product detail page that is not really resonating, engaging and with your end users, right? Because then you're not really getting that conversion. So um, depending on which um, retailer you are working with, let's just take um, Amazon or Walmart for an example, they have very specific guidelines on what that product detail page should look like and how your assets should look, especially on the hero's queue item you are seeing right now here, a three pack from WD-40. But then after that, you really have the opportunity with infographics to really educate about your product and what um, solution or problems it really solves. So that is something that we really engage in. And we also like to include, you know, engaging video content here. We find that to be very compelling as well. And then it is really about that same approach again, testing and learning. Don't just go out and assume you need to change your content across all brands. Use your data and analytics that you have available and have that data really tell you what your next action steps are. Test and learn it. You know, yes, that has increased my sales, you know, multiple times and then expand it out. I think it is really critical that you want to keep your shoppers engaged. And this is your one opportunity to do that and intersect with them. By being the category leader as WD-40 is, there also come some challenges potentially with that. Um, you know, Christina was mentioning um, WD-40 is really used for that category. What that means in regard to search terms is that your competition potentially is gonna go after that search term to benefit from some of that um, traffic that that word is generating. So you really need to take a def more defensive approach here and or if you're a smaller brand that is an opportunity for re to, for you to really go and check a more established brand already but um i think the most or the biggest key key takeaway here for you should be content is king and you really want to make sure that your content is up to date really informative and engaging to your end users and having a brand like WD-40, people are very emotional and excited about this brand. Everyone has a story where their grandfather or their grandson used it together. Um, in one instance, for example, I was traveling, I think um, a week ago back from Germany and some people on the plane saw my backpack with WD-40 and they were sharing with me, you know, I really remember to used to work with my dad in the garage on some cars and we used your product all the time. And it really reminds me of the really good times. So how do we really make sure we can translate some of that um, into our product detail pages going forward is gonna be a good opportunity for you to really engage with your customers and friends. And then also explain to them what your formula and product does. What are the different delivery systems you potentially have? Um, what are the ingredients? you know, you are utilizing if you have like healthy food, for example, really playing into that segment and communicating that to your audience. Uh, all super helpful, Claudia. And I've got a few questions that have come in that I think make sense to, to hit on now um, for you. So let's start with, do you audit the WD-40 product data and images on various e-com sites? And if so, how? Yes, we do. And we have um, various approaches um, to that. We do that on a regular schedule and it is a cross-functional work really with between our marketing and sales team and then also um, our program network in certain channels. Um, it is critical to really go out there because content changes, right? It is not that you go in and set your content, especially on amazon.com, Sometimes you have 3P resellers overriding your content. So it is really important and critical for you to continue to monitor and correct your content so you can ensure your brand message is consistent 
across all e-com platforms and also actually in store, right? You really want that whole omni-channel approach. And I think um, just because we see it across brands, right? And the Profitero tool helps brands do this monitoring. I think there's usually two categories. So there, our tool provides daily insight, right? So you could track daily changes. There's one set of users. You'll hear us talk about a hands-on keyboard approach, which is that um, dynamic nature of the channel for many retailers and being able to react real time. So we have like alerts that you can set where you get an email if content changes. So you don't have to be mining the data, but you get alerted for things that matter. And then the second use case we see is really more of a scorecarding approach. So if you're a senior executive, the last thing you want is a bunch of emails that an image changed, right? But you probably want to know from a trend standpoint, month over month, are the teams making the right changes to content? Are the right images being added, right? And how am I compared to competitors? So that's, that's also a primary use case for our data to be able to enable like the same way that when you are setting your offline goals for the year and you say, hey, these are our KPIs, we need to grow uh, two points uh, in feature and display. And you know that that's going to translate to sales. The same thing is true for e-commerce, right? Hey, set KPIs. We need to ensure that our, you know, the 20% of SKUs that drive 80% of our sales all need to have six images, a video, blah, 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 because those things correspond to sales growth. So um, just to, to underscore a couple of things. And then on the ratings and reviews before we move forward, um, Claudia, thoughts on using a syndicated review service like Bizarre Voice to generate more reviews. Yeah, I think that is definitely um, a great advantage to do, to do. And Bazaar Voice is one of um, our partners as well. There are various others out there as well that you can work with. Um, some of the retailer websites have actually started to not allow to do some of that. So for example, Amazon is just utilizing their own um, review section, so you cannot really syndicate that data, but we find it to be extremely beneficial for our own website and then with some of the retailers that still allow um, to continue to do that. It also gives us that opportunity internally to really be listening to our end users and their feedback. That's just really critical um, for us to make sure we can um, address and, and really meet their needs when they go and shop for our products. Perfect, okay. There's a couple more, but I'll, I'll pull them in when they're um, a, a little bit more relevant. We'll keep pushing through the framework here. So um, beyond kind of, okay, you know, you land on the product detail page that needs to do everything that all those other factors used to do, right? The TV ad, the friend, advice from a friend. But, you know, what is this actually, right? We're a data-driven company at Proctor. We do a lot of research like this. So what, you know, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. And so when we analyze, what's the impact? So we looked at a set of, a large set of SKUs and showed when they made these changes to their product detail pages, what happened across both sales traffic and conversion. It's worth noting, our tool also measures kind of sales and share uh, on, on amazon.com, which is how we're able to get the data. And so you can see, right, pretty significant change, especially from a sales side. And Claudia highlighted earlier the value WD40 had already identified in adding videos. We see this across categories that consumers, it's two things, right? So when they get to your page, consumers like to be able to, you know, watch a short video, get a feel for what the product is. But the other thing is it's back to this like hacking the algorithm thing where there are various factors that retailer search sites are considering when they figure out which products they want to show you in search. And we tend to see that adding a video enhances that position. And so then it's that flywheel kicks in again. Well, if you're a little bit higher in search, the consumer is going to buy your product a little bit more often. As they buy your product more often, sales is also a key factor in the algorithm. So your product's going to keep crawling up in search, right? And same thing is true of adding images and then enhanced content, right? So you got an example on the right from Ready Ranger of some beautiful A plus content they have below the fold. So as you scroll past the key elements of the product detail page over here on the right of the screen, you see this enhanced content on the bottom. And Again, we're all consumers, right? So you, we have a feel for it. You scroll down on the page when you're really getting ready to convert and you're like, want to make sure you really understand what you're buying and these things uh, have a noticeable impact. And then uh, last one for this informative section, this is uh, just to make you all aware. So we work with a company called Visit Bam. There's other there's kind of similar companies that are leveraging AI 
to enhance um, product content on retailer sites. And so what Visit does is they've created a, think of it like an AI powered panel where you can tell the technology what your core demographic is and then they put all your images through the system and score them to let you know which products your core demographic or which images rather your core demographic is more likely to respond to. And so Masterlock uh, worked with them, put all their images through. They decided that the one on the right was scoring the best. And then you see on the right hand side of the slide, the sales traffic and conversion impact that they had just from swapping images out. Right. So again, back to this idea of hands on keyboard, best in class organizations where their top SKUs, right? Masterlock isn't going to do this for all 300 SKUs or however many they have in their catalog, but this safe is one of their top SKUs online. So making sure putting some extra effort in and to have this, you know, always uh, refining approach to content has a meaningful impact to sales growth. All right. Let's move to the next one, which is value. Claudia, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, the V in Diver stands for value. And this is all about defending and enhancing what makes your brand unique. You have the opportunity here to really differentiate yourself from the competition. After all, who wouldn't want to pay a dollar more for Oreos, right? That's very compelling here. Christina, if you could move to the next slide, please. When established friends value is even more important in the e-commerce space. If you consumer searches for products using generic category keywords like soup, the competition will face much larger than if they are search specifically for your brand terms Campbell soup. So the more consumers narrow down by using your brand term, the less you will have to spend to stand out. It's one of the reasons why Nike was able to completely walk away from Amazon back in the day. Their brand is so strong, consumers only shop by brand to find them. So they really didn't shop for tennis shoes or soccer shoes. They shop for Nike soccer shoes. And that's how they showed up all the time. And they didn't have to um, worry about the broader category um, search terms. There is a caveat to that, though. Having a strong brand can be a huge advantage, but it can also be very expensive to protect your brand as competitors will increasingly invest in your branded search terms to benefit from your traffic. So that's where you, as the more established brand, have to go into a more of a defensive mode and really make sure that incumbent brands aren't taking advantage of you and stealing your um, search terms to increase their rank within the um, page one. Christina, is there anything in addition you would like to add here? Yeah, I think two thoughts. So the first is getting on the list. And um, I'm sure a lot of you have either already done it or will do it in the future is managing some difficult conversations on why should we invest in various programs in e-commerce when it's still a relatively small percentage of total sales. So we would, in my PepsiCo days, uh, Kroger is a critical customer. Kroger has a program called $5 Fridays. And $5 Fridays gets you a lot of new shoppers to your category. So you're, it's like you're giving away products or you're offering them at significant discounts, but it gets you on the list. And the behavior we see um, in e-commerce, especially in like an Omni world, so in pure play, like an amazon.com or walmart.com, um, shoppers, they're, they're searching uh, for exactly what they want. It's not as common that they're going to their previous purchases. But for a Walgreens, a CVS, uh, Kroger, right? For those um, shoppers, Instacart, they're going to their previous purchases very frequently. And so by investing early to get on the list, you're driving um, future purchases and loyalty. And so making the investment decision can't strictly be based on an, a short time horizon ROI. It's really about, well, what's this gonna drive in terms of customer lifetime value by getting on that list to begin with? The second piece is on measurement. So Claudia made this distinction between general search terms and then moving to branded search. And what we see high-performing teams do is separate those things out to say, what is my share of page one or my share of the top 10 spots for generic or, um, or unbranded terms versus so, uh, soup 
versus what is it when someone types in Campbell's soup. For soup, if you're Campbell's, right, you should aim to get your fair share would be like your in-store share. So say they have a 50 share of soup. I have no idea what they have. So they have a 50 share of soup. They should aim for at least 50% of page one. But Campbell's, when someone types in Campbell's, like that should be like 90%. You need to make sure you own that, right? In the same way that if I'm a shopper and I'm walking in and I want Campbell's soup, there's like a 90% chance that's exactly what I'm going to buy off the shelf. The last thing you want is for Progresso, General Mills to come in and say, oh no, we're going to sponsor Campbell's and we're going to make sure all our products are at the top of the page when they search Campbell's, right? So having that kind of differentiated approach on how you benchmark for branded versus um, generic is critical. All right. Claudia, you want to speak to this? You want me to jump in? Um, no, happy to speak to this. Okay. So more than ever, your brand is less about what you say, and it is really more about what consumers say about you behind your back. So consumers are considered to be the new brand managers. What they tweet and what they post on TikTok may have a much bigger influence on your sales than any Super Bowl ad. So to take the example here of Gorilla Glue, who saw their searches on Amazon go up by over 4,000%, and sales rank increased by 129% on Amazon after a TikTok video showed a consumer using the product in their hair. One caveat here I want to point out again is this can go both ways, right? This can be a really amazing opportunity for you to accelerate conversion and sales, but it could also go the other way and really damage your brand if the video or the content isn't as favorable for your brand. So it is really critical for your internal teams to stay on top of user generated content and really develop a routine to um, monitor that, you know, within e-tailers, social media, across the um, e-commerce space. Christina, anything else you would like to add here? I think the, uh, the only thing to add is many retailers are giving more and more share of above the fold of space on page one to user generated content. There are many reasons for that. I think a primary one is shoppers are looking for it. Like before they convert, shoppers are looking for reviews. They want to see pictures of the product that someone else purchased. What is this box going to look like when I get it? So keep that in mind. Like it's not just this off site activity, right? TikTok, that's an, it was an incredible story. I'm sure everyone's familiar with it in the past year, but also beyond that and an everyday basis on your product detail pages, it's important and critical to know what consumers are saying about you because it's the spotlight. Yes, you're going to upload your images. That's only a portion of it, right? And what, what shoppers and consumers are saying about you is really important. All right. So then the last aspect of the framework is agility. So uh, we've said hands-on keyboard, we've said dynamic. At this point, you're sick of me saying all those things, right? But it's just, it's moving at a very quick pace. And we'll just end with a quick anecdote because I think this highlights it perfectly. So this rivals my Beyonce slide, I know. Um, but the this is one of our favorite stories to tell. So in December of last year, a couple of weeks before holiday season or you know Christmas holidays, um, one of our clients uh, competes in the kids' toy space. And they notice, because you can track, or you should track availability for your SKUs and competitive SKUs. That's one of the things that PropTera app does. They noticed that Barbie was going out of stock already in the first week of December for the Barbie dream house, which if there's any parents in the room, I'm sure know that that is a hot commodity. Maybe you were the reason that they were going out of stock. So they realized, wait, there's still three weeks of pre-Christmas shopping and we can capitalize on this. And so they worked with their agency to sponsor all the keywords related to the Barbie dream house and their sales were off the charts. They basically told us they paid for the Profitero contract and then some just because they were able to conquest the unavailable search positions that Barbie dream house created. And they were able to capture all of that interest. So this is what I mean in a real world, in a brick and mortar environment, that's very difficult to achieve, right? The, the supply chain constraints, getting products to stores, getting real-time visibility to where there's an out of stock. And then actually you can't like make a sale with two weeks left in the year to get your product. In e-commerce, you totally can't, especially in a pure play world. So it's a, it's a fun one, it's compelling. And I hope it sticks in your brain, right? Because you're by, by enabling teams to work in an agile way, right? I know we have executives in the room. And so you're not the one with your hands on the keyboard. 
but you can set your teams up for success, right? And enabling them to work in a way that says, hey, your priority is to check for conquesting opportunities, monitor unavailable products, capture real-time demand, make sure you're coordinating cross-functionally for the implications of that real-time demand. Um, it should be fun. Like I was on an e-commerce team. It's really fun. Like Claudia, you can agree or disagree, but it's, it's a fun space and the ones who are doing well, they're, they're keeping it fun. I agree. And it's extremely fast moving. I think it's really important, like you were saying, to empower the teams as well to make decisions in the moment and really try these tests and learns and not have them being bogged down, you know, by internal processes. I think that's really critical there. And then also, if you think about starting to build your e-commerce team, there are certain characteristics, you know, and skill sets that are needed in that particular space. And it's really important to recruit for that and then continue to build onto that as well. And the, the last slide that we had, I <laughs> didn't plan it, but it kind of highlights those points, right? It's all about kind of investing now, investing in capabilities, investing in people, uh, making sure you're creating an ecosystem that encourages people to think outside the box. This channel is different. And part of what happens when you're in this phase, when you know your capabilities aren't quite where they need to be, is you have to encourage people to build those capabilities and to build new processes. Um, and also uh, just a, a plug, we did some research recently on kind of org design, how to set your teams up for success. Um, I took a 30 page report. So if you're looking for some nighttime reading, feel free to shoot me a note and I can, I can get that over to you. Um, all right, we've got uh, just over 10 minutes left, um, time for q and I'll leave this up here in case folks um, want our contact information, want to keep the conversation going. I know there's a couple other questions, so I can start with these and then um, Delaney, I know you're helping us out behind the scenes and we really appreciate it. If you want to send us any additional ones, please do. Um, there's one question on, on D2C and I'm not going to ask Claudia to answer it, right? Because we don't need, you know, WD40's secret sauce and how you're thinking about D2C, but I can answer in a general way on kind of how to think about D2C versus um, like omni-channel or working with retailers. I think, you know, for a lot of the brands in the room, I'd be surprised if the answer is that you should have a really large D2C uh, presence. Um, the, what I would constantly think about when I was on the brand side, when I know a lot of brands think about, you don't want to compete with your customers, right? So the way to use D2C is really from a data standpoint. And how can you start to aggregate first party data to get smarter about your consumers and then bring those learnings to other channels, bring those learnings to your retailer partners, say, hey, we noticed that this product we sell on D2C the consumer is you know, X demographic. And I know that that's also the demographic that you're really interested in growing. We think that this product is the right fit, right? And to bring smarter sales stories to your retailers to ensure the greater likelihood of success once that product's in the shelf. Um, and then the, you know, another real life example from a client we're working with, they launched a new product, Digital First, uh, which is a big deal for their organization. And they went Digital First in pure play uh, e-commerce and D2C. And then they, actually that playbook I just walked through, they did exactly that. So they built it up, they figured out who is this consumer, and then they used sales stories, both from Amazon sales and D2C to get sold into Walmart, to Kroger, to various, re Meyer, various retailers, say, look, this, this works. And so while it's an uncomfortable playbook and it's probably not your normal go-to-market strategy for innovation, it's a way for, for the consumer they were going after, which was like millennials that primarily shop online, they needed to prove it out there and then bring it to the retailers who are also trying to capture demand from that consumer. Um, and then I think there was a quick one on, oh, sorry, stop sharing my screen. My bad. Here we are. Um, I know there was a question on, on kind of Profitero costs. Uh, whoever said that, feel free to shoot me a note. In general, the way Profitero works is we, it's, it's all based on the number of retailers you want to track and the number of SKUs you want to track. Um, and costs kind of go up and down from there. So there's, you know, very entry level. We work with small brands. Um, we also work with massive global brands where we're tracking dozens of retailers across dozens of countries and dozens of teams. So um, we're flexible. We work with brands um, of all sizes. Just checking the questions here, see if I'm missing anything. <laughs> Claudia, uh, any? Build on to that, Christina, I think the Profitero team, it is really scalable to what your needs are. And you have not only really amazing tools to make, you know, brands job easier on a day-to-day -day basis, but I think also the team behind the scenes 
to provide some guidance, some thought leadership, and also some analysis. Um, you have that SI team, you know, your analytics team. I think it's um, been a really great um, strategic partnership for us so far. I did not uh, pay her or ask her to say that, but I think you know, I came from the brand side and I was familiar with the different partners that were out there and I, I chose, I, I wanted to work here, right? So I, I think there is validity to that. And the other thing is from the value proposition standpoint, uh, if you're a small brand, you're probably pretty resource constrained. And what I was doing, because I was on the, an e-commerce team, it was like five of us and I was the analyst. So I spent every morning manually going to all my product detail pages and checking to make sure everything looked right. That's a terrible use of time, right? There's technology that can do that. So if you're a small team, it's like as, as basic as that. And then if you're a larger team, you need a way, like we talked about those use cases to compare apples to apples across markets, to understand how different teams are performing, to scorecard performance, again, in the same way that you do for your brick and mortar world. So um, both are, I think we're quite good at both. Just checking if there's any, okay. One more question for you, Claudia. How does WD40 translate Gary Ridge's energy to ensure to ensure the tribe are brand ambassadors? Yeah, definitely. For the people that are not as familiar with WD40, we consider ourselves being a tribe. And that really is something that Gary has spearheaded and really set our culture up for that. So I would assume that everyone working at WD40 is an ambassador for the brand. And we really are taking it a step further. I would believe that the majority of people using our brands are becoming brand ambassadors as well. It is really all about um, creating positive lasting memories within our interactions with our end users, our partners. And we are really happy to continue to be able to do that. And I think the digital forum is a really great opportunity for us to continue to build on that um, and continue to build it on for future success. Awesome. And then uh, you got another one on Profitero. Does Profitero track viewability rate? If so, what are the keys to increasing? So I that could mean two things. If the person wants to clarify, please feel free. But uh, there's two key metrics that I think that could be getting at. So we track in stock. So like if it's if the product's even available. So there are times when the product will fall off of the website because it's not in stock. We do track that. Um, we, the, the data sets are from a digital shelf standpoint are two different things. We, um, we connect to actual SKUs. So we match SKUs to URLs and then we go to that URL every single day and ensure that it's in stock, available. We pull the price in, we pull all the product content in. And then the second data set is based on keywords. So WD40 would tell us, hey, every day we wanna know what are the products that are showing up when a consumer types in WD40. And so then we're pulling that in. So in that sense, can the consumer view the product in search results? And so that, again, on a daily basis, you're able to pull reporting to see what's your share of page one. Are my products even there? How is it trended over time? Uh, lots of good insight to pull from that. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, it looks like that's everything. Uh, the content, I don't know. Um, I believe you'll be getting the slides. Uh, our contact information was there. Feel free to reach out to either of us on LinkedIn. Um, if you didn't get the email addresses and we're, we're always happy to chat and thank you so much for having us.